Luke chapter 21, our devotion, your redemption, your redemption draweth nigh. And when you shall see Jerusalem to pass with enemies, then know that the dissolution thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter into. For these be the days of vengeance, and all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck. In those days, for there shall be a great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there be signs in the earth, sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations, with perplexity of sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud, with the power and great glory. And then these things become, begin to come to pass. Then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. I see the world today in perilous times. I see the countries like Iran building nuclear technology. I see the Muslims, especially in this country, have 22 fortified cities that they are building to raise up a group of extremists in our own country. And our leader just looking away like it isn't existing. Our brothers and sisters around the world are dying for the sake of Christ. Americans are losing their jobs to overseas. I see the strange weather patterns. I see a government that has the lack of good courage, for the most part, to make the right and hard decisions that need to be made. I see a country that is spiritually and morally spirit spiraling out of control. I see Satan and his cohorts working overtime to bring destruction to families and on the church. But should we simply sit back and throw our hands up and say, well, there's nothing we can do? Well, that's not what the Bible tells us. I say never, never should that be our attitude. Edmund Burke said one of the first uh, conservation uh, conservatives that ever lived said nothing is so fatal to religion as indifference. We must be a people that are willing to stand on the word of God, be willing to stand for what Christ had for us, and be willing to stand on what Christ has put in us. Edmund Burke also said the only thing that is necessary for triumph of evil is good men to do absolutely nothing. Can you say amen? amen? Hosea 4, 6 said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy people. Psalm 13, 3 says, The foundation of the foundations be destroyed. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The righteous need to go to the throne room of God. They need to obtain the mercy of God. There needs to be a private revival in our hearts, ladies and gentlemen, in this 11th hour. We can no longer play church, but we need to be the church. We cannot talk about the things of God. We need to be the things of God. Amen. We need to be salt and light into this dying lost world that so desperately needs Christ. We can't sit there no more with indifference and see the world go into hell in a handbasket and do absolutely nothing about it. But we need to be a people, a people that have vigor, a people that have courage, a people that are willing to say what needs to be said to this lost and tired world. 
I look and I see that we cannot grow weary in our labor for the Lord, but we need to be that people who are willing to go out and express to the lost that we are in the eleventh world, we're eleventh hour. I see in the most of the epistles the call for those people who are the remnant of the church to be able to stand and to be able to endure all hardness and to be able to do those things which the Lord has called us to do. Many people look to the Lord and they don't know where to go. They don't know what they need. But Lord, we need to be the balm of Gilead. We need to direct people that are living in this darkness. The greater the darkness, the brighter the light that is within us, the better that the salt that we have within us should be. The Lord is looking for His bride. We should be shouting from the rooftops to those brothers and sisters who are lukewarm. You need revival in your heart. You need to come. The Lord is coming. We no longer can sit back. You can't look at all the entertainment of the church and think that's going to pacify a holy and righteous God. But we need to be a people who are seeking after Him that I may know Him in the, in the resurrection, that I may live for Him every day of my life. We need to have the armor of God on. We need to have that armor that is talked about in Ephesians 6.13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand the devil, way, devil, the evil day, and having done all to stand. We need to stand firm. We need to stand on this word of God. We can't retreat back. We're in a time where we can't afford to do such things, but we need to go forward. We need to stand on what the word of God says. We need to stand on the faith, and we need to know that the Holy Spirit of God is living within us. Amen. We need to have our eyes focused on Christ <coughs> by doing the things that we are called to do. When Christ comes, will you have your lamps filled and your wicks trimmed? Or will you be the five foolish virgins who are at asleep when the Lord returns? Jesus said when He returns, will He find faith on the earth? God will always have the remnant who will be in step with him, in him, and about his business. Are we going to be that church? Are we going to be those people? Are we going to be that salt and light in this lost and dying world? It says, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with the power and a great glory. And when those things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your hands for your redemption, draweth nigh. You see, we have a future. This is not our home, gentlemen and ladies. This is not where we're going to spend eternity. We've been called to be ambassadors. We've been given the great ministry of reconciliation. We've been given something to do while we're here. And we've been called to, as the Lord says, I'll get you home someday. Some days you're going to be there. But for right now, this is where I called you to work. I called you to be in Jerusalem. I called you to be in Israel. And I called you to reach out to the far parts of the world and to reach out to those who don't know Christ. We can't no longer in this day, in this hour, be a complacent group of people. But revival starts in our heart. It says in 2 Chronicles 7.14, this is what we need to do as a church, as a country. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray. When was the last time you prayed? When was the last time you humbled yourself? I say that to myself as well. And seek my face. When was the last time we sought the Lord's face? Has our life become so busy that we don't even seek the Lord's face? And turn from our wicked ways. That I will hear from heaven. And I will forgive their sin. And will heal their land. It starts in the church house, ladies and gentlemen. It starts here. And it starts with us, the remnant of God, those that know Him. And it carries out from there into societies. 
I've read about every great revival that has broken out in the world. And everyone started in the church, in the hearts of the people, and then spread out into the communities, wherever that revival was. And the nightclubs were empty. The police station jails were empty. People were in the church house. They weren't no longer doing their own thing, but they were right in the church to hear the word of God, to get right with Him. Can this happen in 2012? I pray it does. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for the promise that Christ is returning. He is our Redeemer and He will come in the clouds. We're thankful for that time, O oh God, when Jesus will come. We ask you, Lord, this morning to start revival in our hearts. To help us to be the people that you've called us to be. To be where you want us to be, in the center of your will. O oh Lord, it's the eleventh hour. The bars are full of people that watch the Packer game, but your church house is empty. This world is falling out of a spiritual and moral decay unlike I've ever seen before. And the church is silent. Lord, I pray you waken the dead church. I pray that you waken up brothers and sisters that are in lukewarm churches. And I pray that the word of God will again prick the hearts of man, that the fire that's in the belly would again do the work that only it can do. I pray that we confess what needs to be confessed, do what we need to do. And I pray, Holy Father, you heal our land. I pray, Lord God, that you started here in this church house. I pray you started in my own heart. And I pray, Lord God, that you would do a work that only you could do. And I pray that you help us to be that salt and light. I pray you help us to be that balm of Gilead. I pray you help us to be a people unlike any other people. That when people see us, they see Christ. That they see something different about us. I pray that we not only know you, but that we become in your character. I pray, Lord God, this morning that you guide us, that you help us to be that church. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen.